right, let's um, open our Bibles, if you will, to uh, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, we'll get rolling here. Uh, it seems like time always seems to fly, but Matthew chapter 7, the Bible starts off, uh, Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall, shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote of, out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, then shalt thou see clearly to cast the, out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Let's bow our heads for a quick word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you once again for a chance to be here. I do pray that you would set me aside this morning, uh, Lord, that you would take the words out of your book and minister to the hearts of your people. Uh, they have taken time out of their schedule to be here on a Sunday morning and hear from the Word of God. Uh, Father, they certainly don't need to hear from me. I do pray that, uh, Lord, the scattered thoughts and everything that are going around through my mind might be uh, somehow or another uh, unscrambled as they come out my lips and that they might um, be applied to the hearts of each and every individual that's here this morning. I pray that you'd bless us and uh, watch over and give us safety. We certainly thank you for the weather and everything that you've done, and we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we've been going over um, uh, the Sermon on the Mount for several weeks now. This, this week we should finish things up. And we talked about earlier, uh, you are the salt of the earth. And there was a whole lot of things that went into that. If you missed that, too bad, get the tape. Uh, it should be a good sermon for you to listen to. Amen. We, uh, we jumped into you are the light of the world. We, we, again, folks, you guys don't realize just how valuable, just how important you are to the Lord Jesus Christ in this, this world and this earth down here and getting the gospel to a, a bunch of needy people. We talked about uh, the Lord's ex expectations and how they seem impossible. I mean, none of us can live up to them. But then we also talked about uh, the unbelievable forgiveness which we find in the Lord Jesus Christ and the undeniable love that we find in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we talked about, uh, a couple weeks ago, requirements for a real relationship, and that is simply having a sincere heart about the things that you do. You can't be fake. I mean, you may be able to fool some people sometime. How does the saying go? You can fool some of the people some of the time, and, or all the people some of the time, and some of the people all the time, but you can't feel, fool all the people all the time, amen? But you can't fool the Lord any of the time, amen. all right? So we talked about uh, one of the requirements for having a real relationship, not only on this earth, but uh, with your Lord and Savior, and that is a, um, a sincere heart. You need a sincere heart. You need a single-minded heart, something that you're, you're focused on. Uh, there can be no other, and certainly there's a security that comes along with that as well. I think it was last week we talked about kingdom principles to avoid Christian casualties. Kingdom principles to avoid Christian casualties, and... We went over, don't magnify the moat. We just read the beginning of John chapter, I mean, uh, Matthew chapter 7, and we talked about the moat that is in um, thy brother's eye, and you've got a beam in your eye. We spent a lot of time talking about that, and we'll re refer back to that again a little bit this morning. We talked about don't discarding the, the valuable things that you have and the value that is within you. I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ created you something special and something valuable, and they, he does not intend for you to take your life and the things that he's given you and the things that he's blessed you with and who he made you and cast it before the dogs, before the world. I mean, you ought to appreciate what the Lord has done for you and use it for his honor and his glory. And then we talked last week about, um, you know, ask, seek, and knock. Basically, don't play hide and seek with the Lord. Don't hide from the Lord and not bother seeking his advice when you have trouble, when you have problems, when you're going through trials. Listen, the Lord wants you to come before him and ask him, and he's perfectly willing to hear. 
In fact, oftentimes he's just sitting back waiting for you to come and approach unto him so that he can give you the answer that you've been looking for all along. But sometimes he won't give it to you unless you seek it. Amen? I mean, you've got to knock on the door before the dog starts barking and someone knows you're there. All right? So we, uh, we went over that. And then we talked about um, the, the kingdom, and I, I threw up a, a drawing last week, and it was a little confusing. It, was, it made sense to me because I work in radar, and I'm used to looking at radar signals that go up and down, and it means something to me. But I tried to simplify it a little bit. And basically, uh, what we're talking about in Matthew chapter 7, uh, 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, is we're talking about the kingdom. The Lord Jesus Christ, God, offers to mankind a kingdom. All right? Now, there are two different kingdoms that he offers, and those offerings don't always come at the same time. And that's what I was trying to depict in that uh, drawing last time. So basically, the black line uh, down, think of the bottom lines down here is, is on earth when they're being offered to you. Black line is the kingdom of heaven, uh, red line is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is a physical, earthly, visible kingdom. And the Lord's intent when he created this whole planet was to give the inhabitants a physical kingdom and a spiritual kingdom both. They should have been together. The Lord wanted to bless us with the whole works and give it to us. And he created Adam and Eve perfect and without sin. And he, he set them in the midst of the garden. Everything was perfect. They didn't have to worry about snow. They didn't have to worry about the, free, the fruit uh, freezing. They just... Everything was grand, and then they blew it. And so what the Lord did is he took that spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God, spiritually Adam and Eve died when they ate of that fruit, right? The Lord said, the day that ye eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Well, Adam lived for 942 years, if I remember right, 940, 942, something like that, years, if I remember, all right? So he didn't physically die that day, but spiritually he did. And the Lord took that spiritual kingdom away and said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, you guys aren't ready for that right now. We're going to have to address that one a little bit later. And so you see the physical kingdom, I mean the spiritual kingdom, that red line over there at the beginning stopped. But he did offer to them a, a physical kingdom. And you see that through the patriarchs up into the, uh, the children of Israel. He offered it to the children of Israel. David, of course, was the king. Uh, and the, that kingdom was available to them. And then eventually they rejected God to the point where God said, okay, that's enough. Nebuchadnezzar came in, took them uh, captive. The children of Israel were kicked out of the land in 586 or so B.C., and that's the break in that line right there. And there was really nothing. I mean, men just kind of survived, I mean, until the Lord Jesus Christ finally showed up once again uh, at, when he was born, right? When he came back, this, when he came to this earth as a baby, he was getting ready to offer that kingdom, both the physical and the spiritual kingdom, to mankind again. He was here. He was the Messiah. He was ready to give that, that offering, and he was ready to allow mankind, if the Jews had accepted him as the Messiah, if the Jews had been on the ball, accepted him, and trusted him as their Messiah, those things would have been simultaneously here on this earth, and it would have continued on to eternity. But that didn't happen. And so the Lord, the Lord once again uh, tried to offer it to the Jews. They rejected it. That physical kingdom the Lord then took away again. But he left us a spiritual kingdom which is what you and I, the Gentiles, and any Jews that would like to get saved during this time period, he left us a, a spiritual kingdom that we can get involved in right now. The offering that he gives to us is a spiritual kingdom. Now, later on, when the Antichrist comes in and you hear all the things about the mark of the beast, 666, all that kind of stuff, that's during a seven-year tribulation period. And during that tribulation period, before that tribulation period, the church gets taken out of here. That spiritual kingdom gets taken up to heaven. And the Lord goes back to dealing with those Jews once again, and hence you see that physical kingdom being offered again to the Jews. That's what that is supposed to represent. Of course, they go through the uh, tribulation. Finally, things kind of get settled down. We come back with the Lord at the second coming or the second advent. 
uh, we come back at, at Armageddon and, and we have this final war. We kick Satan out for a thousand years and both of those kingdoms once again are uh, available here on earth. We're here. We're hanging around ruling different cities. There's also a physical kingdom here. The, uh, Jesus Christ is going to sit on the throne of David. All right. So that's what that was all meant to be. And I don't know how we spent a half an hour on a review. But let's go back to Matthew chapter 7 and let's pick things up in... Uh, verse, verse 12. So to finish up the Sermon on the Mount, the final in the series, I just titled this More from the Master on the Mountain. More from the Master on the Mountain. I just kind of enjoyed that. I was going to put a picture of a guru up there on top of the mountaintop, you know, but I figured that would probably be inappropriate because <laughs> that's not what we're after. But the Lord Jesus Christ was on a mountaintop with his disciples and he was teaching them. Amen. Um, let me repeat, these lessons that we're going over in this Sermon on the Mount, they're not how you get saved today. You don't get saved um, by, by the principles that you find here in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, okay? There's just some doctrinal things that don't quite work, but they are good lessons to live by, right, amen? And I've got three final lessons this morning. I'll try to go over them relatively quickly. But three final lessons that if you will follow, if you will take heed, it, it will make your life down here on this earth, folks, much, much better. Amen. Amen? Three simple lessons, nothing real drastic this morning. But each one of these lessons has got a positive side as well as a negative. And it really is up to you to decide which one of those two uh, experiences you want to have. Um, as with most things, the Lord Jesus Christ gives you a choice in how you live your life, right? He doesn't force you to serve him. He doesn't force you to follow him. He doesn't force you to receive him. He doesn't force you to read your Bible. He doesn't force you to have fellowship and pray with him. He gives you a choice. And I would just like to say as we finish up this morning that if you will make these three choices, the right choices in these three areas of your life, listen, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ can move in there and bless you and, and do things in your life that you never imagined possible, right? I mean, we just read through verses 1 through 11 and finished up with, you know, ask, seek, knock. The Lord is just sitting there waiting, waiting for you to give him a little bit of attention, a little bit of preeminence a little bit of your time, your talents, your effort. And the Lord's just waiting for that because he has in mind to bless you, to pick you up, to carry you through your troubles and trials, but he can't do it if you don't go to him. Amen? So let's look at the final, um, final three uh, sections here in Matthew chapter 7 this morning, and we'll turn to Matthew chapter 7. Let's look at verse 12. Verse 12 says this, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. This is the law and the prophets. Brethren, that verse right there is a verse that you need to remember. Amen? Listen, this verse starts off, therefore. So, I mean, it's in relation to all the stuff that's been going on before it, but it's a powerful verse. You could do a whole series just on this one verse right here. Because, brethren, this verse right here, um, listen, it sets the tone for how you and I ought to behave one towards another. Amen? Listen, it sets the tone for how we ought to conduct our life. Uh, so the Lord, in his final, his final stretch, when he's been teaching his disciples up here on this mountain, he's given them all these instructions, all the things that we uh, went over, all the things, and then he kind of gets into this summation mode. And we're down here, and he says, uh, Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Right? The Lord knew that he would be leaving his disciples shortly, and he knew that they would have to actually get along with each other once he was gone. All right? I mean, it was difficult enough while he was there. But he knew that 2,000 years later, you and I would, sitting be, would be sitting here in Hastings, Minnesota in 2016, and you and I would have to get along with each other through some trials and some tribulations, and he knew that every one of us would be different. 
And who knew that every one of us would look at things differently and every one of us would have a different viewpoint and different concerns and different cares and our feelings would be hurt by different things. And some of us would have very thick, tough skin and it takes a lot to get us aggravated. Others would have thinner skin and it doesn't take an awful lot for those wounds to be felt very deeply. And he knew that's where you and I would be in, in 2016. He just knew that's what men were made of. Amen? So he knew all that. He knew we were going to be the salt, we were going to be the light. And he knew that after spending all that time talking about not magnifying the moat that is in your brother's eye. I mean, he spent all that time, we went over all that last week, right? Don't, don't examine your, your brother so closely. It's, all, it's easy to find fault with somebody else. It just is. It is. It's so easy. I mean, you can pick anybody else in this room, and you can probably come up with a list of a dozen things like that that they're doing wrong. Amen? That's okay. Everybody else in this room can have a dozen things that you're doing wrong as well. And they're probably all different lists. <laughs> Amen? But, um, but listen, the Lord spent all that time talking about not worrying about the moat in your brother's eye, trying to keep the focus on yourself. And then he sums it up in this verse right here, and he says, Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Once again, in finalizing and finishing up the Sermon on the Mount, he reverts back to basic, simple Christian principles. And that is, we just spent several minutes, even today, talking about this grand thing and this kingdom and when the kingdom of God was here, when the kingdom of heaven was here, and what that was all about, and how the Lord Jesus Christ is dealing with the Jews, and how it went to the Gentiles, and we get all that straightened up in our mind, and that is really great if you understand all that. But you know what's even more important? How you get along with each other. Amen? Amen? The Lord sums all that stuff up. It is knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Listen, the bottom line is you can know all the right doctrines. You can know all the right ins and outs of your Bible. You can have that thing memorized. You can have that King James Bible on your desk, on your phone, on your tablet, on your laptop. You can have that King James Bible all over the place, and you can be poor, wretched, and miserable inside. Amen? And a lot of... A lot of what you have going on inside, brethren, is going to revolve around and, and show up in the type of fellowship that you wind up having with others. All right? Now, I, I use uh, the term fellowship in the sense of basic interaction. I'm not talking about a close spiritual fellowship because this verse applies not only to saved people, but it applies to lost people. And the Lord, when he's wrapping things up in the Sermon on the Mount, he once again takes you back to this fundamental, basic, simple principle, brethren, of how do you, on a very practical level, interact and teach and work with other people? All right? You can have all this head knowledge about the Bible, but if you're walking around and you're a jerk most of the time, it doesn't work. All right? There's just something wrong with that. Listen, if you're walking around here and you find that you have a lot of difficulty in establishing and maintaining relationships, you just can't be friends with anybody because all those people are crazy. They're nuts. None of them, none of them do right. They're all crazy. I've said that before. <laughs> well, maybe it's you. Maybe it is you. Listen, how is your fellowship? How do you interact with people? How do you get along? Because the Lord, the Lord looks at that, and the Lord notes that, and the Lord has certain expectations. Again, this can be a very positive thing or a very negative thing. Right? Because if you're following this, listen, if you're the type of person that objectively follows this, and when you come to deal with somebody else, and you have interaction with them, rather they're lost and it's business, whether they're saved and it's, it's a, you know, a spiritual matter or a matter concerning the church or a matter concerning kids or a matter between husband and wife, and you have this interaction. Men, if you would, if you would treat your wife this way, 90% of your marriage problems would go away. Amen? 
Wives, if you would treat your husbands this way, 90% of your troubles and trials in that marriage would go away. All right? Listen, we just, we fail to do that. We fail at the fundamental, simple, basic things because our head is so clouded and, and you know, so um, uh, tied up with all the big, heady, haughty things. We forget to be nice. <laughs> we forget to be courteous. We forget when we're dealing with one another, hey, I've got another human being sitting across the, the aisle from me, and they have feelings, and they get sensitive, and they have good days and bad days as well, and, and we forget sometimes because we're so focused on getting our agenda set and our point across that we forget all about the other person. Well, how would that work if that's what was done to you, right? Right? How would that work if that's what was done to you? Listen, all too often, our philosophy, our, our, many people have this philosophy, and that is this, do unto others, then split. <laughs> right? Do unto others, then split. Listen, Deuteronomy, I won't, take, I won't take the time to have you turn there, but if you'd like to, you certainly can. Deuteronomy 19 uh, the Bible says this, One witness shall not rise up against a man for, an, for any iniquity or for any sin, in any sin that he hath sinned. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall a matter be established. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days, and the judges shall make diligent inquisition, and behold, if the witness be a false witness, and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. Wow. Put that one on for size. <laughs> you know what that means? Again, basic, simple, we're not talking salvation here, we're talking how do we get along. Right? That... That means, listen, you fly off the handle at somebody and you want, the, you want something done about it. I want my revenge, right? I want justice served. This person has wronged me. Listen, brethren, the principle is that same thing is going to be done to you when you wrong somebody else. And the other principle is, if you're wrong, if you're wrong, back there in the Old Testament, God said, whoa, 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 I'm going to do that to you. You wanted to do this to your brother? Ha, watch this. Scary thing. Scary thing. Then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. And then it says this. The rest of that verse, so shalt thou put the evil away from among you. You see, the Lord, the Lord does that to a man so that all of us learn the lesson, we don't treat each other like that. Right? We're above that. Again, we're talking Old Testament principles, I understand, but still, good principles on how to, how to um, uh, conduct business and fellowship with each other. How's your fellowship amongst one another? How are you when it comes to interacting with other people? Because if you follow that principle in Matthew chapter 7, you're going to have a lot better success at it, I can guarantee you. Amen? Listen, I remember the story of uh, es in Esther, you have Haman, and he hated Mordecai, right? And he went and he, you know, Haman had the power. See, that's when you're in trouble is when you get somebody that has enough power to do something about it. Haman had the power, and he went and built the gallows to hang Mordecai because he just despised him because Mordecai didn't, didn't appreciate Haman the way that he should have. And what happened? You know the story. Haman wound up getting hung on his own gallows. See, the Lord, the Lord put that thing in action, right? Listen, the principle the Lord leaves his disciples with towards the end of that Sermon on the Mount is, listen, by the way, guys, by the way, 
Don't forget, treat each other the way you want to be treated. I'm not talking salvation. We're talking practical living and how to get along. All right? Practical living and how to get along. All right? So you come home from work, and the house isn't as clean as you would like it to be, and you yell at your wife. Well, what about when she gets in the car and the oil's low and the oil lights come on, comes on because you forgot to check it? You want her to yell at you too? <laughs> See, you, you, listen, I am a firm believer. Husbands, the Lord will deal with you largely based upon how you deal with your wife. I've just seen that over and over and over. If you're charitable and compassionate and long-suffering and you go out of your way to take care of her and you have a heart and a compassion to, to take care of her and to love her and, and you know, uh, raise her up and honor her, listen, the Lord notices that and will bless you because of that. Amen. Flip side, again, there's a positive and a negative. If you don't do that, why should he do that to his bride? <laughs> Which is you if you're saved, right? Again, Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, principles. You know, when it comes to fellowship, all too often this happens. All too often we, we get hung up and we get angry and we start yelling and shouting. Listen, then it turns to this. Some of you say, oh, I know that girl. <laughs> and then you know what happens? You know what happens? What happens is you just run away from your problems. All this time the Lord's trying to get a hold of you, get a hold of your heart, and get things fixed and give you the answers. And you're fighting against him. Why? Because you forgot this one basic, simple thing truth in the Bible, right? Treat somebody else like you want to be treated. It's, it's not hard to learn. It's hard to do, right? I mean, to learn to have compassion, to learn to, to, learn to be uh, gentle and to learn to be understanding and to learn to be long-suffering because that's what you expect the Lord, that's how you expect the Lord to treat you, Amen. Listen, it's not do unto others, then split. Right? You run away, you wind up running away from your problems. Nothing, nothing gets taken care of. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is a law and the prophets. The Lord sums up, brethren, so much of how you and I can get along in church, in a marriage, in a family, at work, in one little verse right there. And if you'll follow that verse when it comes to your fellowship, brethren, I promise you, things will work much better than they might be working right now. Amen? We better hurry. Let's move on. I don't even have time to go into all this. Because, well, before we move on, listen. We get so persnickety about minute details. And when someone doesn't live up to those minute details, if we're not careful, we can know all the Bible in the world and we'll crush them. There was a guy, the story is told of a guy walking a, uh, across the bridge one day and he saw a man standing there about to jump, uh, jump over the edge of the bridge. And so he ran over and he said, stop, 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 don't do that, don't do that. And the guy looked at him and said, why shouldn't I? And he said, well, there's so much to live for. The guy looked at him and said, yeah, <laughs> like what? He said, well, are you a religious man or not? And the guy said, yes, I am. He said, oh, me too. Are you a Christian or a Buddhist? The guy said, I'm a Christian. Oh, me too. Are you a Catholic or a Protestant? The guy says, Protestant. Whoa, me too. Are you an Episcopalian or a Baptist? Baptist. 
The guy says, whoa, me too. Are you a Baptist of the, of, um, the church of God or a Baptist of the church of the Lord? And the guy answers, a Baptist of the church of God. Whoa, me too. Are you an original Baptist of the church of God or are you a reformed Baptist of the church of God? A reformed Baptist of the church of God. Whoa, me too. Are you a reformed Baptist of the church of God of the Reformation of 1879 or a reformed Baptist of the church of God of the Reformation of 1950? He said, a reformed Baptist of the church of God of the Reformation of 1915. I said, the guy said, looked at him and said, oh, die, heretic. <laughs> That's the way it happens, <laughs> right? That sometimes, sometimes we, we get so wrapped up in ourselves, brethren, the little, least little thing causes us to push somebody else over the edge, right? The least little thing causes us to push somebody else over the edge. And brethren, that's not the way it should be, Right? That's not what the Lord intended for his disciples. He had them up there on the mountain and he's talking with them and he's leaving them and he's giving them these, this wisdom. And you know what his grand wisdom from the master on the mountain is? In essence, Bob's paraphrase, be nice to each other. <laughs> Whoa, deep theological precept there, right? Have you got that or do we need to explain that a little bit more? Listen, you combine that with not magnifying the moat in your brother's eye, and do you know what a valuable asset you become? If you can combine those two principles, just learning how to treat somebody else like you want to be treated and not using that magnifying glass to stare at the moat in their eye, knowing full well you have a beam in your own. Listen. That's the way it should be. This is how we should be with one another. And I gotta, I, I've got to say, in general, we do a real good job of that here. All right? There's always room for improvement, but we do a real good job of that here. We don't, I've been some places and some churches where, I mean, there's just tension and fighting all the time, and it is a blessing to be somewhere where that's not the case. We spend far more time on the roller coaster ride, brethren. Right? than we do yelling and screaming at each other. And that, that is a blessing. Again, the most famous verse in Proverbs 18 says, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Right, next lesson. Next lesson. Not only uh, fellowship, the Lord talks about fellowship, but the Lord gives them a lesson on following. Go back to Matthew chapter 7, verse uh, 13. And he says this, he says, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come, on, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth the evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For, um, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. But folks, there's a there's a, there's a narrow gate. There's a narrow path. There's a narrow pathway. Listen, there's a way to follow the Lord Jesus Christ that is straight, that is true, and, and unfortunately, few people take that path. I mean, you guys are here on a Sunday morning, amen? You at least have some desire to take that path. That's a good thing. 
But the world has it set up that you can be so easily distracted. But the Bible says that the, the way, the right way is narrow. It's straight. Few people find it. Right? Few people find it. Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We could take all kinds of time and talk about that in great lengths. You are going to apply that to salvation. You're not going to find salvation in any other way, right? Amen. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby ye must be saved. The Lord Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the door, right? I mean, you look to the Lord Jesus Christ for our answers. We know that. But it is so easy, it is so easy to be sidetracked from that. And you know what it, ra what it revolves around? It revolves around who you decide to follow. I mean, there are false prophets that come into the world. And the Bible says in, in uh, Timothy that men shall have itching ears, right? They shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They don't want to be under authority. They want to hear what sounds good to them. And it's easy to find an alternate path. But the way of the Lord Jesus Christ is straight and narrow. And he reminds his disciples in the, fi in the final moments of the Sermon on the Mount, after he's had his disciples up there and he's been teaching them all these things, he reminds them the fundamental basics. Treat one another the way you want to be treated. And watch out because the right way is narrow. And there are false prophets out there. There are people out there that would love to get, get a hold of you and just draw you away from where I want you. Right? The world would love to draw you away. The devil would love to draw you away. Your flesh would love to draw you away. You say it's a lonely way. Sometimes it is. But not that lonely. You're never alone. I can guarantee you that. Positive or negative, it's positive to go the straight and narrow way. Why? Because the Lord can bless you. Amen. Because the alternative, the alternative is the wide gate, the broad way that leadeth to destruction. And we talk about that and preach about that time and time again, but the sad truth is, folks, if you read your Bible at all during the week, you're in a minority. All right? Most people don't. And the, Lord, the Lord's got his disciples up there on the mountain, and he's given them these instructions, and he wraps it all up and reminds them of simple, basic truths. How to treat each other. Right? How to stay on the narrow way. Because there's many false prophets that would love to come in and deceive you and take you away. It happens, listen, it happens, it happens in churches. Inevitably, you see this happen. You see, you see a, a, a new Christian come in, gets, uh, he gets saved, comes in, you know, is on fire for the Lord, and there's going to be somebody around that wants to all of a sudden take that person off and disciple them. A cousin, an aunt, a family member, right? They want to get their claws on them, and they take them and they drag them in the wrong way. Happens over and over again. And the Lord reminded his disciples there, listen, false prophets are going to be out there. How do you know them? By their fruits. By their fruits. Take a look at what's going on. Because the truth of the matter is, you will follow somebody. You will follow someone, right? You, you know, you may be thinking you're kind of pious right now, and you may be going, hmm, not me. I follow Jesus. Oh, yeah? I would venture to say you probably just follow yourself. Because <laughs> the truth of the matter is, you're going to follow somebody. I mean, Paul said, be ye followers of me, even as I also am a Christ, right? You're going to follow somebody. Who are you following? How's it working out for you? Who are you following and how's it working out for you? See, the Lord, the Lord gives you some simple tests. Treat each other right and then be careful of who you're following. 
And then he just says very simply, listen, if you're following the wrong person, the fruits will be wrong. If you're following the right person, the fruits will be right. Who are you following? Because the vast majority of people take the broad way. Right? Who are you following? Who are you following? Ye shall know them by their fruits. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. All right, so you take a look at this little congregation that we have here. And I would tell you, check it by the Bible. What are the fruits? Good fruits, bad fruits? If it's good fruits, okay, jump on board, follow. If it's bad fruits, hey, listen, I love having you all here, but go find somewhere else. Right? I mean, certainly, hopefully you're not here for me. I mean, okay. <laughs> But who do you follow? Again, the Lord's telling the disciples, pay attention to who you follow, because you'll be able to tell them by their fruits. You'll know if you're following the right direction. All right? We better get to moving. Matthew 7, 24. Therefore... Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and it beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which buildeth his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them. The Lord is right down to the final few verses in the Sermon on the Mount after teaching all the stuff, good stuff, and he brings it back to the very fundamental basics. Oh, by the way, don't just hear about how to be a Christian. Do it. Right? We're not talking great theological deep concepts. We're talking simple, practical advice on how to succeed. On how to make it work for How to make Christianity work for you. Right? Right? How to get in touch with the Lord. How to, get, how to get the Lord on your side so that he can bless what you're doing. And the simple, simple principles like, oh yeah, treat each other nicely. Huh, who wouldn't have thought of that, right? Another simple principle. Watch who you follow. Final principle here this morning. Hey, listen. Watch what your foundation is built upon. Amen? Watch what your foundation is built upon. And I see we're running you know, late on time, but you know as well as I do, the Lord Jesus Christ is the rock. But listen, your foundation, brethren, should be built upon the God that created this universe. Amen. All too often, we get our eyes off of the Lord, and we start putting our energy and our effort, and we start building our lives on something other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Money, a career, a, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, a husband, a wife, a car, you name it, right? A new pistol, a, entertainment, sports, whatever. You, you build your life around all these things, and, and that is what you focus and you build your life on. If someone was to come and look and examine your life, what they would see is this great big structure built on those things that are so important to you. And the Lord says, no, 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 no. You need to build your life on the rock. 
right? You need to build your life on the rock. Why? Because the foolish man built his house upon the sand. You say, that's a deep theological concept. Yeah, we teach it to the Sunday school class, the little lambs, right? What are they, two to five-year-olds? The wise man built his house upon the rock. <laughs> Six, yes. <laughs> See there? And you know that song, don't you? Yes. She could probably come up here and sing it for me. I don't want to embarrass her, but. The, but the Lord, after all this teaching to his disciples on the mountain, takes his disciples right back to the very beginning, the fundamentals, and he leaves them with this. And this is where I'm leaving you today. Treat each other the way you want to be treated. Brethren, the problems that you'll eradicate, just doing that one simple thing, especially, like I said, if you combine that with not looking under the magnifying glass for the moat in your brother's eye, just treating each other the way you want to be treated. Watch who you follow. Check out the fruit. Hey, if the fruit's there, if it's worth following, follow it. If it's not, don't. And then finally, listen, you need to re-examine and figure out where are you building your foundation? Because you can build your foundation on a lot of things in this world. A lot of things. But in the end, they wind up being sand. Now I imagine at one point in time, the person that built that house probably thought they had a pretty thing, good thing going. They probably enjoyed Many, many days and nights in the shelter of that house. But the problem is it didn't last. It couldn't weather the storm. It crumbled when the pressure was on. And he, the Lord Jesus Christ leaves his disciples. The final illustration he gives them is Pay attention to what you're building on because it's going to have to weather some storms. It is going to have to face some hurricanes. All right? It is going to have to maybe face a tornado. Pay attention to what you're building on. And if you build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ, that will never happen. But if you build your house on anything else, I can guarantee you that will happen. You may get by for a while. You may weather a few pretty bad storms. You may have to go out and just do a few minor repairs and you know, repair the roof a little bit, maybe a, a broken window every now and then. And you may think for a while that you've gotten by, you've escaped. You're the one that was able to build your house on the sand and it worked out fine. But I'm telling you, it won't. And the Lord wrapped up the Sermon on the Mount reminding his disciples to treat each other nicely, to watch who they follow, and to make sure they built their foundation or their, their house on the right foundation. And then let's close things down, take a look back at the last couple of verses of Matthew chapter 7. And it came to pass when he had ended these sayings, I'm in verse 28, the people were astonished at his doctrine. Now that ought to tell you something there. He just got through telling them, oh, by the way, treat each other like you want to be treated. And it says about that, People were astonished at his doctrine. <laughs> That's really wild. But then look at verse 29. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. You know what they were astonished at? They were astonished at the fact that when he told them these precepts, it was more than just idle words. 
when, I don't care who it is, when somebody gets up there in that pulpit or stands behind uh, the podium and teaches Sunday school or teaches Sunday school class out there, when they break open that Bible and they give you something out of that Bible, folks, it is more than just idle words. Amen? And one of the things that stood out about the Sermon on the Mount to these people that were listening was he taught them as one having authority. They listened to that thing and they said, whoa, there's a little more to that than what I thought. I've been living my life and doing okay. I thought I was doing okay, but when I listened to this man, <clears throat> there's some things that clicked that make a little more sense now. Amen? He taught them as one having authority. Listen, I just ask you, as we uh, get ready to close here, how's your fellowship? Really? Among brethren, among the sisters? Who are you following? How's it going for you? What are the fruits? Is it doing something in your life? And then where is your foundation? Where is your foundation? Listen, if you do those three simple things right, those three simple things right, your life will make amazing changes. All right? And again, if you take it, we don't have time to right now because I know most of you here this morning are, are already been born again, you're saved, and I don't need to cover that uh, again. But if you apply that towards salvation, I'm looking at the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. He is the foundation, right? I have fellowship with Him. I follow Him, absolutely. But this morning, I was just kind of concentrating on practical things amongst people. And the Lord finishes out this grand Sermon on the Mount with those three simple principles. And I would just say, brethren, if you, if you follow those, you can't go wrong. Positive. It's good. Your house will be on a rock. But if you don't, Sooner or later, you may make it through the first or the second storm, but sooner or later, that's where you wind up. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Bible once again, for you sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, down on this earth to, uh, to die on the cross to pay for our sins. Uh, Lord, we are grateful for that. We certainly could not have made it out of this world uh, on our own merit. There is none of us that are good enough to get to heaven on our own. Father, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I do pray that you would minister to the hearts of your people. I pray that um, if there is, Father, somebody here who's never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, that maybe uh, something that was said or something that was read may have touched their heart and prodded them just enough to make that decision. Um, Lord, if, if, they're, if they're lost, they certainly have no foundation. Um, but Father, for those Christians that are here, I pray that you'd take those principles and help us to apply them to our lives. They're what, uh, what you left your disciples with at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And Lord, again, it's just good practical advice for living down here in this earth with one another. And I pray that you'd uh, work in our hearts now as we sing this final hymn of invitation. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.